Okay, if you can't read that, is that too loud? If you can't read that, come closer, because there's going to be a lot of code here. Um, and so the beers for me, the T's for the voice. Uh, this is a talk about data log. Who here has ever heard about data log? Okay, perfect, nobody. Who here has done SQL before? Okay, some kind of like document databases, Mongo, things like that. Anything? Yeah. Mm. You guys don't actually code, do you? <laughs> okay. So, this is going to be a weird talk because it's, 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 it was originally for like a two-hour workshop. And so what we're going to do, because I think Anya only gave me about 40 minutes, 40-ish, is we're just going to stop at some point, right? Because <laughs> there's not much more we can do. But we can always talk at the after party. So, usually this talk can go both ways. So one way is I talk to you for 40 minutes and convince you to try data log and sort of tell you why it's cool and why this new technology is, is, is something you should be interested in. But this is Pivotalk, so this is not that talk. This talk is actually going to just assume that you really want to learn data log. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with like very little Lego pieces and we're going to quickly build up to a big thing. And the idea is that we're going to try to give you an intuition for why this is awesome without ever actually saying this is awesome. Okay? So I need you to concentrate for like the 40 minutes and then we can go drinking, except for me who started. Because we're going to go very fast down the rabbit hole. I can't give the usual introduction that I give of why and how I build systems. So I'm just going to do this one slide, this one set of slides, which is if you do anything with modeling actual real-world businesses and domains, it turns out there's only three things you need to do to build a system. And that's you need to have streams, trees, and meshes. These are the only data structures that ever actually matter. So streams just tell you things about, uh, give you semantics of order, right? This is like the events that are coming into your system. These are the queues that are backing up uh, on, your, you know, on, your, on your queue system and things that are just not working correctly. There are trees. Trees give you hierarchy, right? Your entire Ruby stack is basically one big hierarchy of objects in memory. Your UIs are just a set of trees that talk about the hierarchy of your DOM and so forth. And this is a graph. This is what your business domain is. Unfortunately, we don't like to admit it. And this is why we have problems. This is actually a very specific kind of graph that I like to call a mesh. And to explain this by analogy, imagine that we're Spotify. In Spotify, there are only three actual kinds of nodes that are interesting to us, and that's an artist, a listener, and a song. And anything you build as a Spotify developer is actually just a new relationship between things that exist already. So when you want to create the idea of uh, an album, you just create a new relationship between an artist and some songs, and give it some metadata, you know, like this is the title of the album, it was released two years ago. Similarly, when you create a playlist, it's a new relationship between a user and a set of songs that we've decided that are important for this user. If we come back with a feature that says we want users to be able to subscribe to playlists, we're now creating a new kind of relationship between that user and some playlist that was created. And with every single feature that we add to the system, we're just creating more and more relationships that, between things that already exist. And sooner or later, our business domain looks like this. And this, by the way, is why a lot of projects fail. Because if your main database for your domain is a relational database, then with every single feature you add, you are essentially doing new implicit joins between existing things. And it turns out that a relational database is terrible when it comes to doing these kind of implicit joins that, right? Like you join every single thing and you end up moving it to all to Mongo because you've given up or to Elasticsearch because you don't care about your data or a bunch of other things. So are we agreed that graphs are the way to build domains? So assuming that, a data log is one way, not the only way, but a really good way of talking about how to actually build this kind of stuff in production. And data log has this nice interesting idea that it doesn't matter how complicated your domain is, you only need this to describe it, right? An entity attribute value triple store. 
also known by, as RDF, if you're like into the semantic web kind of stuff. And I don't expect you to believe me, because I know you've all written very complex systems, so something as simple as this could not possibly work. The point of this talk is to actually show you that it does. So we're going to do this by analogy. We're going to use GitHub, because I assume that you're all domain experts, so I don't have to actually explain what a GitHub is. And we can get straight to the code. This is essentially the rest of the talk. On the right-hand side, what's going to be happening here is this is your data structure that represents your database. So you can imagine this is some vector in memory, or it's a file on disk that we're just going to keep appending to. And the stuff on the left is the code. right? It's like your queries. It explains all of the data we're interested in, and so forth. And the one thing I want you to focus on is no matter how complicated the stuff on the left gets, the right-hand side is just an EAV structure that we're just going to keep adding to, to the bottom of it. We're going to build an append-only database that represents all of GitHub. OK? So the first thing we have in GitHub are users. So let's add some users. So we have some JSON, you know, some, something comes over the wire. And so we add three users into our system. And so what happens here? We're just specifying a username, because that's the attribute of the user, and a value. And notice that we have three numbers here, because we have three unique IDs, because there are three users in our system. So the fact that there's different IDs, integers, means that there are different things. And uh, officially, this thing is called an entity. And each of these rows is called a datum. OK? So far, so good? So now we have our, some data in our system, and we want to query it. I know it's not a very complicated database, but we'll get to that. So in order to build a query, we first need to talk about pattern matching, because this is the DSL. So a pattern matching is basically just a vector of three elements that represents the EAV structure in our database. So wherever we see 11, it's going to find all the datums such that the entity is 11. And underscore just means I don't care. It's a wild card. So this finds 11. This will find this last datum. This one finds all three, because all three are usernames. This will find this single datum, because all of the values match. And this finds nothing, because there is no such datum where all these things are all true. right? So that's nice, but that's not interesting. So now we have variables. Variables start with a question mark and some name. So this finds all entities. This finds all attributes. This finds all values. This finds entities and attributes, entities values. And this is essentially a table scan, right? This says, just give me everything. So also, not very interesting. But we can combine things. So we can say, find the datum such that username is pitiless, and the value 33 bind it to E. OK? Similarly, we can do something like this. Or we can, for example, say, find all usernames, and then bind each of the IDs to E and each of the values to V. So now we're ready to do a query. A query, much like in SQL, except instead of select where, it's find where. Find tells us what we're interested in, and where tells us how to find it. So where is nothing more than just a set of clauses that we just saw. So in this case, what happens is we're going to find 11 username, and then we're going to bind the variable name to Rich Hickey, and that's what find is interested in. And so that's the result. It's a set of tuples, in this case, a one element tuple, because there's only one thing we were interested in, which was name. Now, the important thing is that we're always going to be returning sets of tuples, OK? So I didn't ever said, but data log is actually a declarative logic programming language. So actually, it turns out that order doesn't matter. So anything that is unknown, it'll figure out. And anything that is known, it'll just match it. So we can flip this, and we can say, this time, I know what the username is, but I don't know the ID. So it'll find the actual ID. This time, I don't care what the ID is. I want you to find all usernames and we're trying, re return the values. So again, a set of tuples, single value. I need you guys to like nod along as we go. Perfect. Or even better, if something doesn't make sense, yell. I really don't mind. I love hecklers. <laughs> OK, so speaking of sets. This returns all of the attributes in our system, but there's only one attribute, right? This is how sets work. It removes duplicates. Um, so coming back to our previous query, 
This returns all usernames. There's a little sugar syntax we can use in find. So by default, it returns a tuple of a uh, set of tuples. If you add this like a little ellipsis, it'll just return the vector of values. And if you use a period, it'll just return one value. So for like a million points, why did it return Tonsky? Is someone brave enough to speak up? So it matched all three, but it returns a set. Sets have no concept of order, so it'll just return one value such that it's true, right? So you have no, you have no control over that. Okay, so let's talk about multiple bindings. So here we're gonna find the usernames, we're gonna bind the IDs, and then we're gonna bind the names, and what you see is now we have a tuple of two values, right? So now we can actually return multiple things, and we can sort of return relationships between things. So let's complicate our business domain because it's kind of very simple for now. Let's add an email address. So notice what is happening here. Let's add two more users to make it really obvious. We're adding brand new information to the bottom of the file. We never changed anything we've already added to the system, right? We're appending to the end of the file. And what we're doing is we're using the fact that the ID is the same to, to tell the system that these things are related to each other, they're part of the same entity, right? So now we're actually able to store multiple attributes about something, about an entity. And so once we have that, we can actually query it. So again, let's look for a username or checky. And then here is the magic. Here's the magic of a constraint solver. What it does is it says, if this is ID, then anywhere I use the exact same name, all the values must match. So if it found 11 here, it's going to look for all of the other 11s, and then it'll find the 11 such that there is a user email attribute, and then it'll return rich at e.com, because that's the email, right? But there's no concept of order, so you can flip it. You can say, I know the email address, who was the name, right? Like, who was the person? And also, if something doesn't match, nothing gets returned because all of the clauses must be true in order for anything to be true. And also there can be multiple unknowns. So just playing with this data structure, you can get all kinds of interesting information out of your system, right? So let's make our domain even more complicated. GitHub has this concept of repositories. And to make it even more complicated, Repositories are owned by organizations or users. Now I want you to think about this for a second. How would you develop a SQL database such that you have users, organizations, and repositories, but a repository is sometimes, a repository is owners that are sometimes a user or an organization, right? Like think back. So usually you would end up with one of a couple of solutions, all of them really crappy, where you either have multiple columns where some things are null, or you have additional tables for like many-to-many -many relationships, and you have a bunch of code, or like you, you ignore the data, data in the database completely, and in Ruby, you're basically just running around with a bunch of ifs everywhere. So let's see how this works in data log. So first of all, we create a new entity for our organization. So this is 44, a brand new ID. Next, we create a repository, 55. And notice what happens here. 55 repo owner 44. This value is actually a reference to a different entity in our system. And similarly, we can create another repository data script whose repo owner is 22, which is Tonsky, right? So I want to point a couple things out here. First of all, this 44 and 22, even, it even though it makes sense from a database perspective, is really crappy from a user experience, like a developer experience. So there's some nice sugar syntax where you can replace this reference with a two element, tuple, uh, with a two element vector. So this actually says, find me the entity such that org name closure, the 44, and it'll replace it, one with the other. And hopefully now, it's a little more obvious what kind of polymorphism is going on. Because first of all, we have two repositories. One is owned by an organization. One is owned by a user. They both are called repo owner because that's, from a domain perspective, that's exactly what they are, right? So we don't care about this. The next thing is notice that we've never said anything about schemas. Datalog has no concept of schemas. Basically, most systems, most databases, they force you to encode the schema during writes, 
Data log reverses it and says that the schema you apply is during a read, not during a write. So it's actually very nice because it turns out that a username is always going to be a string, no matter what. But the context of when you actually apply this information changes over time. It allows you to create these kinds of arbitrary polymorphisms. It also allows you to create a different kind of polymorphism, even though there is no example of this here, which is imagine if there was such an entity that sometimes needed to behave as if it was an organization, but sometimes as if it was a user. Then that one entity could have both attributes. And depending on whether you're querying by the user or by the organization, it would behave as that thing, right? So there's a very different kinds of polymorphism that you can do because of this kind of flexibility. So let's, uh, let's like, do a query here. So we start off with the username Tonsky. And then we're going to find the repositories that are owned by this user. So notice again, we're using that magical P. Because it's the same name, it'll find the same values in our system. And then it'll bind the R's for the repository, and it'll give us back the result. So this says, given a username, what are all the repositories that are owned by this user? And as I've been repeating over and over again, there's no concept of order. So anything that is unknown is interesting. So you can flip it. You can say, I know what the repository is. What is the username? Or I can say, I don't know either of those things. Give me all of the repositories. So now, why did it only return data script? What happened to closure? Don't be shy. Come on. It's this username thing. We've created a poly we we've created a complexity in our system because of the way our domain is. Our domain is dirty and complex, and this is the way the real world works. But since we've created this complexity, we have to now deal with it, right? So this act this re this query actually returns all repositories such that they're owned by users. If we're interested in organizations, we just switch username with org name, and now we get closure. And sometimes we don't care. So we have to be explicit about it, but we can do that polymorphism, right? We can say, I don't care if it was an organization or a user. Just tell me what all the repositories in the system are. Now, this or thing is actually a little sugar syntax for something that's called a rule. A rule is, you can imagine, a different data structure somewhere else in the system where you, we give a name to a certain set of behaviors. So in this case, we're, we're saying that a repo owner is something such that has an org name or a username. And then we can sort of use it like a function call inside of our, the rest of our logic. The other nice things about rules is that they can actually call each other and call themselves. So they're, they're, they can actually call themselves recursively, which means, it turns out, that data log is a wonderful weapon of choice when you have graph traversal problems where you're not sure exactly how many hops you have to do to get to the thing you're interested in, right? Like the classic example is solving things like the Kevin Bacon problem, right? Like you have some Hollywood actor, how many like jumps do you have to do to get to someone that you're interested in, right? From, from, from arbitrary actor to Kevin Bacon. So these are the kinds of things that Datalog does naturally and very quickly, I might add. So our product owner comes back and tells us that now we have to talk about forking in GitHub, right? So again, how do we model a fork? What is a fork from a domain perspective? It's in fact a repository, just like any other repository, so it has a slug and an owner, but it also has a reference to its origin, right? So what we did was we created a repo fork attribute where we were talking about the original repository that it was owned by, that it was forked from. And notice, again, we're just adding new data to the end of our file. We haven't changed anything up to this point. Notice also that we didn't go back and add repo fork nil to all of the other repositories in our system. This actually has wonderful consequences. And the reason why we don't do this by default is because if you live in a rectangular world of relational databases where all columns must exist for all rows, then you have things like null values, right? Because physically, there needs to be something there because of like padding and performance and something like that. Now, once we leave the rectangular world of relational databases, it turns out that you don't need things like nulls, right? You can, the, the act of not, the simple fact of not having attributes actually signifies a lot of important information. 
it allows you to do things like say, give me all of the repositories that are forks. Notice that I don't even care what the original repo is. I just care about the, fa the fact that this repository has such an attribute, right? Similarly, I can say, if it's missing, that I know that it's one of the originals, right? I can easily now find all the original repositories in our system. And I can talk about relationships between things. So here, I'm going to find all the repos, but I'm going to call it original ID. It'll find three repos. And again, I'll do the same exact query, but this time I'm going to give it a different name. And then this third clause does all of magic, because it actually specifies a specific kind of relationship between the fork ID and the original ID. And the logic solver, actually, once it hits this clause, it realizes that all three repos are no longer valid. It has to backtrack and has to figure out what combinations exist such that all of these clauses are still true. So now that we have an easy way of talking about how do we find relationships between things, right? So that's all nice and good. What about multiple values? We have this very simple data structure here, right? EAV, what if there are multiple values for an attribute? So one such implementation feature in GitHub is the idea of languages. You go to a repository and it tells you that this repository was written in Ruby and JavaScript. So how would we model this in data log? What we do is we would simply repeat. I never said anything about the fact that a single entity can have a single attribute only once. If there are multiple such values that are true for an entity, then just repeat yourself. Similarly, DataScript is written in Clojure and JavaScript, and my fork is also written in Clojure and JavaScript. So now that we have this, we can actually talk about it, right? We can make queries about it. We can, for example, do things like, just give me all of the languages, right? Tell me what languages are in GitHub right now. So again, six values, but only three results because of sets. We can also say, I'm actually interested in what repositories are written in these languages. So this actually is like a table scan of repo to language, right? All the different relationships that we're interested in. And just because you can have multiple values means you can also have multiple references because references are a different just kind of value. So the most important feature on GitHub are stars, right? It doesn't matter how good your code base is. It doesn't matter how maintainable. It doesn't matter that the library has been running in production for 20 years. The only thing that ever matters in GitHub is how many stars you have. And the question is, how do you model this relationship? Because we talk about how many stars a repository has, but that's not actually what we're modeling. What you model is a specific user starred a specific repository, favorited a repo, right? So Rich Hickey only favored his, Tonsky favored two, and I also starred two repos. So again, multiple values, multiple references, just means multiple entries in our system. But this is the way we model the system. This isn't the way we're interested in interacting with the system. What we're interested in is how many stars a repository has. So for this, you need aggregations. So how would this work? Well, you would find all the repos. You would, again, use the magical binding to find all the Rs such that at least one star exists for them. Then I would take the people that, use, that starred that thing, and I would aggregate it, right? And I would get the result. Three for closure, two for data script. Now, as you can see, find has, can use parentheses to do aggregations. Here's an example of count, but as you would expect, Datomic and Datalog and all these implementations have support for basically all the kind of aggregations you would expect, right? Like all the things any, you know, any decent database should do. The other thing a database should do is give you the ability to do custom predicates, because no matter how cool your data query language is at some point, it's going to, you want to ask your database something that it doesn't know how to do. And so here we're going to find repos that start with the letter C. And the magic is in the parentheses. The syntax with this parentheses lets our data log engine talk to the host platform. So the ones, implementations I'm most familiar with is Datomic, which runs on the JVM, and DataScript, which runs on JavaScript. So in both of these cases, this question, these parentheses allow me to 
run arbitrary code that are that's a predicate on my host platform. So starts with method on the class string in Java, for example. So it's not so much interesting that Java class string method has starts with method. What's interesting is that you have a syntax that allows you to talk to your host platform and intersperse it with all this logic programming we've been doing up to this point, right? You can mix and match the way, any way you feel. Another wonderful example of this is Datomic, because it runs on the JVM, has access to Lucene. Lucene is a full text search engine. So one of these things that is nice to show is you have full text searching built right into the database, not because the database does it, but because it allows you to interact with the host platforms. And it gives you a way of giving those results back to the system so you can keep doing your logic programming as if everything was you know, the same as it ever was. So here's an example of returning the, uh, link, the repos that we're interested in for closure from a full text search. And that 0.99 is the rank the Lucene search engine gives you for how good this specific result is. Okay? So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Is there, are there any questions? Except what the hell is going on? Yes. No. Okay. That's okay. We can have, we have time. We have all the time in the world. I told you we're not going to get through all this talk, so it doesn't really matter. So entity attribute value. Hopefully, hopefully I've given you this little seed of doubt that in fact, this is all you ever need. Seriously, it really is. We do this in production. It is all you ever need. Now, the question that might come up, number one, is what about performance? Because this sounds crazy. And it turns out it's really simple because of the fact that it is such a simple data structure. All it has is EAV, nothing else. So it turns out that if you just switch the order of those three columns, you can basically build any kind of, emulate any database you're interested in. If you want a Redis key value storage, you just make sure you have an index built by attribute value entity, and then these kind of queries are basically O of one operations. If you're interested in a classic SQL database, a row database, then you just want to have the index EAV. Again, it's like, look, it's like a lookup in a map, right? Look up the first thing, look up the second thing, that's the value. Now, usually where SQL falls down is aggregations, because in order to do aggregations, you usually need, you know, in the old days, a data warehouse. But what you really need is a database such that it's indexed first by the attribute, then by the entity, then by the value. And then it's really easy to do, like, count P, because all that data is in one specific space on disk, right? It's all there. Similarly, if you want to be Mongo, now, the cool thing about Mongo is you have these like nested queries that you can dig deep in. But the wonderful thing about this structure is as soon as you get to 11 user stars, as soon as you get to this value 55, you just jump back into that index again and you just keep going, right? So it's really simple to do deep traversals this way because you're always using this simple index. Now, what's more interesting is how do you do it in reverse? Because in order to be a graph database, in order to be a Neo4j, you actually need, the way a graph query works is you, you have the answer, but you don't know what the question it was, essentially. So you actually need an index that starts with value, and then attribute, and then entity. And once you have that, you can end, end with the question, so closure, and then look for the attribute, repo slug, and now you have the answer, 55. And so you plug that answer in, 55, 55 user stars, user stars, and you automatically know what E is. So as long as you build an index in this way, a graph database is also really easy to build in a performant way. And so that's actually what happens in these real implementations of data log, is somewhere in the background, these indexes are just kept up. And then if you have really crazy custom things like full text search, this is outside of the domain of EAV, but as, as there are good, you know, like for example, inverted indexes like Lucene, you saw that there's a way to use those different systems using the same syntax. So that's usually question number one. The cool thing, number two, is we've been talking about this username attribute as if it was like some kind of a string or keyword. Although, see, I, I do closure most of these days, but I know this is a keyword, this is a symbol in Ruby, and 
It's the exact opposite enclosure in Lisps in general. So in this, okay, never mind. This, this Ruby, I don't understand. Matt's was he he borrowed from Lisp. Why did he flip them? And sorry, tangent. Username. This is not a keyword or a symbol. What it is is actually an entity in our system, which is amazing because it turns out that since it's a first class entity, you can just give it random attributes just like everything else. So you can give it things like, you can tell it's a certain value type. You can tell it that it's always a string. So your system can like, always check for this kind of thing. You can give it documentation. Like, what is this thing that's stored in our system? Because, because now we have this flat structure, it's usually very good to have good documentation. And also, notice we kept using namespaces to keep that, you know, to sort of keep our sanity when we build these kind of systems. It also can do things like specify uniqueness constraints. So your system, if, if you tell it that this thing's unique, it will actually be able to verify that stuff during, you know, during transactions. And you can even do it things like give it hints, right? So like Datomic, if you give it a DB full text true hint on an attribute, it'll know that in the future you're going to want to do full text searching on this specific attribute. So I better be sure that I have a loosing index that's ready to go for this specific attribute. OK, the next question that always comes up is, how do you do updates in an append-only database where you don't delete anything? Ideas, suggestions. You do what? Introduce nulls. Actually, that's not going to help you. It's <laughs> um, one of the most obvious things you could do is say, well, one of the obvious things is you go back in the file and delete it, right? But that sort of defeats the purpose of append-only databases. The other thing you can do is you can say, let's just add a new value to the end. But if you remember, what that does is it just creates multiple, uh, multiple cardinality for a single value. If I did 33 username and I gave myself a different name, actually what I'm modeling is that I have nicknames. Like there's two user, there's two ways you can find me on the internet, you know, like via Pithulus and via some other username. It's actually a really nice property that I can give it aliases, but it doesn't help us do updates. So this is sort of a trick question because it turns out that EAV is enough to do to talk about modeling your domain, but your domain is information at rest. When you're talking about updating things in your system, you're not talking about your domain. You're actually talking about communicating change over time. And that's the key. This is enough if you have a static system and you just want to talk about the relationships between things. But as soon as you want to talk about updating things and, tr and changing things over time, we actually have five columns. And this is what real implementations of data log look like. This fourth column is a transaction column that says, if there are multiple things that have the same number, it means they happened in the same transaction. They're atomic, right? Asset compliant and all those buzzwords. And the last thing is just something that says, this is something I've learned, or this is something I must now forget. True or false? So when I add information, I'm actually asserting. So I create a new entity at a new time, 3,000, and I'm saying, from this point forward, I now know about a username, OK. That's all. If I want to delete information, I'm actually retracting facts. So what I'm saying is, this username Tonsky that existed before, at time 3000, this fact is no longer true. And it's important that all these values must be the same, except for the transaction and the operation, because remember, multiple cardinality. This gives you a good way of, even if there are multiple things that it might be true, I'm just saying, forget about this one specific instance of the, of, forget about this one specific fact. And hopefully that gives you some hints about how to do an update in place. Because an update in place is nothing more than saying, forget about this guy, remember about this guy, using the same transaction instance, right? So that's updates. Turns out it's not as complicated as you would think. Now the next nice thing is, just like attributes, Transactions are also entities in our system. It's, it's meta, it's turtles all the way down. And the reason for that is that, again, you have really nice consequences because you can add arbitrary attributes. 
For example, this is essentially like an atomic clock, right? Like it's just an atomic number that's rising. But here I can actually specify a timestamp, so I know when, like at the CPU time, this happened, like the clock time. I can also do arbitrary things. For example, we often do things like for auditing purposes, we specify who is doing this transaction or why is he doing this transaction. I can't tell you how many times it's been wonderful to track down a bug and then be able to go back and realize that three months ago, this piece of information entered into our system because we did some import JSON thing, right? It's amazing. Once you have this capability, you sort of think, how do I live without it? So, I don't have much time, I think, to go over this, but basically there's time, some time traveling APIs that sort of give you a hint of why this is cool. For example, you can do things like go back in time and say like, what did this database, you know, given a specific time of database, do this query. Or you can actually do the same exact opposite and say, forget everything from this point forward and just think about these datums. Or just give me an audit, tell me about everything that's happened to my system. Filter out things that I don't have access to. This is wonderful, for, for example, for permissions. We don't, do white, we don't do white and black listing of queries. What we do is we filter out any datums that you are not allowed to see, and then we say, go ahead. You know, the sky's the limit. Do whatever query you want. And similarly with is a hypothetical database. It says, given the database and these additional things, if those were true, what would the result of this be? So it would be like doing a transaction, a query, and a rollback without actually ever touching the database. And this is all possible just because we have a very nice, simple, primitive data model onto which we can apply these magical attributes. Now, this isn't something we're going to talk about today. This would help with cascading deletes. This is one of the last things I want to talk about. Because this is a little, this is like a little cherry on top. On top of everything you've seen so far, which is like this logic programming language, there's this thing called the pool API syntax that's been recently, well, it's, it's been around for a while. But it's picked up a lot of steam because essentially it's GraphQL on steroids. <laughs> what happens is you do the query as you would normally do it. And then instead of sort of pulling out the information you're interested in, you're going to say, assuming this entity is the one I'm interested in, I want you to pull. And the query is a data structure, just like in GraphQL or Falcor, that describes the information we're interested in. Now, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff. I don't expect you to remember all of it. I just want to give you a hint of like the power that's nested here, and I highly encourage you to go and read more about it. So like the most basic thing you can do is build a vector of attributes and say, these are the attributes I'm interested in. But, you know, and like it'll figure out things like cardinality for you. But using like a, a map notation, you can actually do joins. You can say, I was in a repo, but now I want to go to the owner. And from the owner, I want you to give me like their username or org name, whatever it is. And then I want you to go back. This underscore is a reverse graph. It says, I'm in closure land. I'm in organization closure. Now give me all of the repos that this is the, that, that's the owner. And then again, give me some like information. As you can see, like there's like parameterization and filtering, like all this kind of interesting stuff. Again, do another join. This time find me the commits and then like pull out their shots, right? Like our entire back and front end APIs just look like these big queries and then just filtering on the back end for things you're not allowed to do. And then we don't care what the client's asking for. That's, that's, that's the idea behind like this GraphQL and Falcor stuff. So this is like, I think, the end of the talk because this is, I think, slide 150 of like 250. <laughs> uh, among other things on this link, on this gist, is the rest of the talk, like a lot of the interesting stuff we, want to, we might want to talk about. So I probably, I don't know how we're with time. Maybe I'll show you one more thing. So like applications, one thing is event sourcing. You, anytime people have played with event sourcing, they know that the main problem with event sourcing is how do you migrate data when your schema changes? This EAV st T structure basically says that you don't, oh, I have five minutes, awesome. I'm just going to show you more stuff. So EAV basically says that you don't need to do schema migrations. If you store all your events in this very primitive basic structure, you're never going to have to do migrations, right? Similarly, like this is Datomic. This is a very simplified model of Datomic. What they do is they separate the transactor that's responsible for taking new writes into your system. 
they don't do storage. They say storage is not our problem. Run it on Postgres, run it on DynamoDB, run it on React, run it on file systems, run it in memory during tests. We don't care. And then your peers is what's querying the actual data. And the way we do this in, on the JVM is we actually, this, this peer is actually in the same JVM process as our application, which means that when the transactor is writing stuff and the, the peer is asking for information, because of that transaction ID, you never have eventually consistent data. We always know if we have all the data we need to do the query. If not, we'll just grab it from storage. But what turns out is the way the system is designed, almost it, it, like once you have a nice running system where like uh, the similar kinds of queries are happening all the time, it turns out that almost all the data you need is almost always in memory. It's a wonderful thing when you're doing database queries and you're pulling straight from memory. You're not even doing like over the wire transfers, right? This is a more realistic implementation of data lake because things like memcaching and like you know like the kind of infrastructure stuff. DataScript is a wonderful tool. DataScript is all this the stuff I'm talking about, but designed for web applications for JavaScript. It runs on the J JavaScript engine, and basically you can replace all of your like React. Um, all of your React state management with just one simple database that lets you, and like all our React components just basically do arbitrary queries on this kind of thing. As I mentioned, the pull API is how we communicate front and the back end. We also have an extension of the atomic pull syntax, it's called EQL. It's also on the gist slides that I mentioned, which talks about a syntax for doing mutations. So just like GraphQL lets you do mutations and reads, th there's a very nice syntax for doing all this. Again, we use the same thing for uh, between React components and our data. And this is like a second of four, four stops. So we're just going to stop there. Maybe we have like time for one question. If not, feel free to find me at the after party. I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> and I, if, if you're interested, I highly recommend you check out the gist, where you can find a lot more stuff. OK, thank you. Microphone. No. Technology's hard. Okay, questions. Oh, I okay, can't it works. We have one. Hi. Uh, great talk overall. Really mind shaking, especially in the evening on Friday. Uh, the question is, what kind of data are you storing in, in your data log and whether it, it, is it serving as your main data storage or is it just uh, supporting one? Uh, yeah, it's our main data storage. Uh, basically, we, we store everything in data log. <laughs> I mean, the only thing you wouldn't want to do it, and this is not a problem with data log, it's with the implementations like Datomic with the JVM, is if you have something like you're recording mouse movements. So you're, you're basically just streaming events. This is something you probably don't care about the audit history of. But it turns out that that's the only exception to this rule. And I guess if you have enough memory, then that's not even a problem, right? But that's probably something you don't want to necessarily do. But that's a very specific case. Basically, this should be your default. And this, by the way, is also something I, I should mention. Even if it turned out that we build systems that ended up for, let's say, organizational or other reasons, ended up being ported to Postgres or whatever, I do all my prototyping in data log. Like, this is my go-to database, and I don't leave it until there's a reason to leave it, right? So, like, this should be your default, because if nothing else, the way it helps you think about your domain and focus on the problems that you're actually trying to solve, that by itself is worth, like, a pile of gold. Right. All right, and could you just briefly describe what your domain is, what you are mostly working on? <laughs> um, so right now, I work at a company that uh, does conversational AI. So basically, we build things that people talk to. Um, so like a lot of NLP and AI and stuff like this, and we use data log for all, all over the stack for all kinds of things. But I've used this approach at previous companies from various various kinds of domains. So it really isn't domain specific at all. Thank you so much. And all the speakers have a unique present, a branded Pivarak t-shirt. Denise, it's your turn. <laughs>
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much.